Welcome back to Making the Argument. And today we're going to be asking the question, is Christianity reasonable? Or rather, is believing in Christianity reasonable? Because there's a lot of people that think that this is essentially Santa Claus for adults, right? It's it's wish fulfillment. It's a way to try to, I don't know, guard yourself against the parts of reality you're not very comfortable with. And so oftentimes it gets mocked or it gets criticized as, again, just being relatively childish. But what we're going to do today is we're going to actually talk about about the the moral implications. We're going to talk about the scientific implications. We'll talk about just the concept of objective truth and whether or not Christianity has anything to do with any of these concepts. And probably another important question is what happens if it's not true? We will discuss all of this and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. If you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, or the Making the Argument YouTube channel, you might notice that we've made a couple changes. I don't typically sit here, but the good news is, is again, for this episode, we are all back in the studio. Mr. Nick Freitas is back from Richmond, and that's pretty awesome. But we have a great episode today, and it's one that I'm really excited to talk about because it's something we've been planning to do for quite a while, and I think we've wanted to do some planning for it and do it justice and make sure that we could come to you uh, with everything that we could. Uh, but if you haven't already, I want you to go to the link in the description and join our community chat. And we'd love to get to know you there, and I'm sure we'll be continuing this conversation right there after the show. All right, as always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, back from Richmond and very, very happy to be so. With us, as always, my beautiful bride, Tina, Hello, Queen of everyone. the Bees. You got, you got to wait till I say the Queen of the Bees oh, part. Oh, I'm sorry, is, I was a little yeah. too fast. And then, of course, we have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines, also a mostly benevolent warlord in training. That's going to stick. I'm going to make sure that sticks. I'm surprised you didn't make the joke that, look, Christianity is very reasonable, but, but Christian, Christian is not. Is not. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. It's good to be here in the studio now. We'll see. All right. Here, here we go. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and kind of define our terms, because whenever you talk about Christianity, there's a lot of people who are either not familiar with the doctrine or not familiar with the theology, they'll say, well, which one, right? I see a thousand different denominations and there's Catholic and there's Eastern Orthodox and there's, you know, there's Baptists and there's Pentecostals and there's all this other stuff. And you guys can't seem to get your crap together. And, um, and look, you know, that, that can be a fair critique at times. However, it's important to distinguish that there are, when, when you look at Christianity, there are things that different denominations disagree on, which you could chalk up to uh, everything from style, like the way they like their worship music, versus um, things that we that, that the Bible is not necessarily as definitive on, which is to say that it is a, a core element of the faith, right? So there's, there's things that reasonable Christians can disagree on that doesn't make either one of the people disagreeing heretics or apostates or anything like that, right? So there's there's things that Christians can believe that are not necessarily essential to core Christian doctrine. So first things first, right off the bat, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we wanted to talk about a couple things that if you are talking to somebody that doesn't believe these core things, they don't fall within the the general Christian tradition, right? They, they may say, oh, no, no, we, we believe that Jesus existed or we believe in God or, okay, fine. But Christian, Christianity has certain definitions which are essential to it being Christianity, right? Just because, the, you know, kind of the, the joke is that the mouse in the cookie jar is not a cookie simply because it's in the cookie jar, right? You, you might believe certain elements of Christianity, but since it is a comprehensive faith, Right, if you reject certain points which are essential to it, well, then you really can't call yourself a Christian. So, here's just three things, three basic things that, regardless of the the Christian denomination, they 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 agree on these things. Right, one is believing in the virgin birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The other is belief in the Trinity or belief that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And another one is a belief that the Bible is the divine, divinely inspired word of God, and it's authoritative, right? And the reason why this is important is because, well, there's certain things within Scripture that, again, reasonable people might be able to, you know, debate. So, for instance, is the six-day creation right at the beginning of the Bible is, is that more on the poetic side or is it meant to be taken literally that God created the world in six 24 hour days? Right. And what you'll find is reasonable Christians that agree on everything I just said will disagree on that. And generally speaking, 
neither one of those Christians engaging in that debate on how to interpret, you know, the, the first chapter in Genesis are going to say that the other one is therefore no longer a Christian if they disagree on some of the finer points on what that could potentially mean, right? So that's, that's just to give you an idea of a distinction between those things which are absolutely fundamental versus those things which can be up for discussion. And one of the reasons why I say the Bible being the divinely inspired word of God is because you do see churches out there now, especially within the, the Protestant side, and I'm, I'm a Protestant, that are essentially throwing out <laughs> whole aspects of, of scripture that they find culturally inconvenient. Right, and that's the sort of thing we would look at and say, no, that's heretical. You you don't you don't get to claim that, you know, if you're saying that Jesus isn't, you know, the you know a part of the Trinity, then whatever you are, you're not part of the Christian tradition, right? And that's not us being mean. That's just saying that there's certain defi- there's certain definitions for things, and if what you believe falls outside of that definition that is that is central to that thing, well, then you're not that thing, right? That's not us being mean. So I want to give people kind of a, a groundwork for at least that, at least that, before we move on to some of the uh, questions that we're going to go through. So, you know, the question that we started off with is, um, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable? Because a lot of people look at things like miracles within scripture, or they'll look at the virgin birth of Christ, or they will look at the fact that the Bible was written by several authors over a span of 1,500 years, and the final book of Revelations was was written in the you know first century AD. And so, gosh, you know, it's been interpreted and all these other things. So is it even reasonable to believe, right? Is it has isn't it obvious that it's full of contradictions or it's full of ideas or misinterpretations or you know scribal errors that that make it hard to rely upon, right? We're going to go over some of that. So what what makes something reasonable? Well, we looked up a couple definitions. One was the Cambridge Dictionary. One was dictionary.com. So Cambridge Dictionary says reasonable is something that's based on using good judgment and therefore fair and practical. Dictionary.com said something that's agreeable to sound judgment or logical. And I would think most of us, when we think about reason in general, what we're, what we're asking ourselves, if someone came to a reasonable conclusion or they made a reasonable decision, we're usually saying, okay, did they use a, a logical thought process in order to look at the evidence that they had available for whatever the decision was? And did they interpret the evidence in a way that made sense, right? To where the, the conclusion they came to made sense. And if they did, we usually say, okay, that was a, that was a reasonable decision or that's a reasonable belief. Um, and, and typically when we, when we get down into kind of what we call the laws of logic, right? The laws of logic include things like the law of identity. Uh, the mathematical version of that is A is A, all right? So what, what we're saying with the law of identity is that the thing that you're talking about, it could be a human being, it could be a table, it could be that there's there's a certain thing, there's a certain definition for that thing right, that makes it that thing. It's that identity. And so if they meet that definition or that criteria, they are that thing. If they don't meet that definition or criteria, they are not that thing. Right? And this is important because how else would we make distinctions between the various things that we see within society if those individual things didn't have definitions or identity? Another thing that we talk about is the law of non-contradiction, which is to say that something cannot be both true and untrue in the same way and same sense at the same time. And um, I, I heard one theologian, he kind of described it by telling a funny story. He goes, if I'm walking with my wife and you come up to me and you look at my wife and say, oh my gosh, I hear you're pregnant. And she says, yes. And I say, no, you're not going to come to the conclusion that, oh, well, both of those things must be true. You're going to come to the conclusion that, okay, something's wrong. Your mind's going to automatically go through this process of, oh my gosh, she's pregnant and he didn't know. Is he the father? Or maybe she hasn't told him yet, or maybe she's holding back for some other reason, or maybe she's lying to me or whatever it is, right? But your your brain automatically go through, goes through this process to try to reconcile the data that you've heard to make it make sense. And that's what we call the law of non-contradiction. And what's fascinating is that there will be some people that will try to kick that as, well, the world's full of contradictions. Yeah, but you don't like them, right? There's, there's, problems, there's problems with contradictions. And every once in a while, I'll see somebody like, oh, I'm perfectly fine with contradictions. And I look back at them and I'll say, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Like, Okay, well, you clearly weren't fine with the contradiction I just made. When I contradicted you, you didn't like it. So just keep in mind that regardless of how some people or some philosophies try to negate this idea of the law of non-contradiction, it's, it's a self-defeating argument, right? So the law of non-contradiction is very essential to logic. 
Uh, another one is what we call the excluded middle. And the excluded middle is to say that when we're talking about things that are either true or untrue, we're excluding, you know, those things where there's, you know, something outside of, of reason or logic that can somehow reconcile these two things. Right. And again, that's just an important concept when we're actually having discussions so that we can make sure that they're productive and that we have a really a, a peaceful and a reasonable method in order to make sense of reality. Right. So when we talk about um, reasonableness, I, I'm just giving you I'm throwing those things out there so everyone kind of understands the baseline of what we're talking about, because at the end of this, you're going to kind of make a conclusion. Right. You're going to make a conclusion based off of the, the, the evidence that's presented here and the way we analyze that evidence. And and you, you may not come to the conclusion that Christianity is true. You know, right? you, you may not be comfortable with that. But hopefully you're at the end of this, you're 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 not going to be confused on whether or not it's reasonable to believe that. Now, maybe you need more evidence. Maybe you need to research more. But by the end of this, you're either going to come to the conclusion that, you know, we're just crazy people or, okay, Nick, I might not be there yet, but I understand why you are. And I understand why somebody else might be. And as I have more questions and you might put those questions in the comments and it might be something that inspires a show in the future, at the very least, you will have heard some basic arguments, you will have heard some basic evidence, and then you can come to the conclusion of whether or not we've been reasonable about this. And the bottom line is, is that whenever we're talking about reasonable decisions, part of what is important is for people to have or to understand where other people are coming from when they make their decisions. So we've, uh, we've kind of had this debate before that even when somebody makes a bad decision, sometimes if you look back at the information that they had at the time, right, it might have seemed like a good decision, right? But then all of a sudden when you add additional information, not only can you see why it was bad, but now they can see why it was bad. But at the time, it might have appeared to be rational. Like, so for instance, let's say you go into the grocery store and you buy some meat and it says American product and you think this must be an American product. When in reality, it isn't. Not in any way that you would actually, you know, have reasonably concluded based off of that, that little little sticker that they put on your meat package. And that's why Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is here to make sure that you have the necessary information to make a good and rational conclusion with respect to the meat that you consume. Because if what you're looking for is meat that isn't stuff full of MNRA virus or uh, vaccines, with what you're looking for is meat that is genuinely raised here in the United States, processed here in the United States, and brought to your table exactly as advertised, then GoodRanchers.com is the place to go. And if you use promo code Nick, you sign up for this in uh, March, they're going to give you, along with your subscription, they're going to give you a free Easter ham. In fact, they have they have a uh, ad for this up right now that I love on, on Instagram where they say, the, the tomb may be empty, but that doesn't mean your dinner plate needs to be. So go to goodranchers.com, use promo code Nick, sign up for one of those excellent subscriptions where you know exactly the sort of meat that you're getting exactly as advertised. Plus, they're going to throw in that uh, that gift for you with that free Easter ham. So go ahead and check that out. All right. Let's go ahead and go into some of the questions about Christianity. And I'm going to start this off. I don't typically do this, but I'm going to start this off with a quote because there's some, there's some um, assertions made by a man that is very, very well respected within his field. It was David Hume uh, and, and well respected on a number of levels, not just on theology, but on, on political theory, on economics. And, and there's a lot of areas within political theory and economics that we would, we would really admire. That we would sympathize with. We would really sympathize and admire Hume, but on theology, very, very different. And so Hume has this quote, and the reason why I'm going to read it off is because he actually makes kind of a, somewhat of a, a comprehensive argument against not just Christianity, but any sort of theology in general. And as we go through the various questions that we're going to answer, I'm going to loop back around at the end, and we're going to address this quote once again when we've gone through some of these other questions that we're asking. But here's the quote from David Hume, and this is largely influential, especially within atheistic circles. It says, if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school of metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? That's the mathematical side. No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? 
No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and delusion. So in that one, that one quote, that one little paragraph, couple sentences, David Hume purports to essentially overturn any sort of school of theology or metaphysics, right? And he's doing this from, from kind of a, a materialistic, scientific point of view. This idea that we should be making decisions about reality somewhat exclusively based off of the scientific method, logic, reason. Can you see it, taste it, feel it, smell it? You know, these are the things that we should be relying upon. And we should be rejecting these ideas that there's some form of miracle that can make it all happen, right? That's, that's what he's doing. So... And this is obviously an argument that many people, especially within the scientific community, have found incredibly convincing, right? For them, they look at this quote from Hume and they say, yes, yes, that makes sense. Leave all your mysticism and your religion out. I just want to focus on the scientific. So let's ask the question by asking some of these other questions. Is that a reasonable position to take? And the first thing that we're going to talk about here is, is it reasonable to believe in God? And I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to ask a couple of things because obviously there's there's an evidentiary standpoint, right? We we when we look at logic and we look at arguments, we look at inductive arguments, which are things where we stack up the evidence in order to determine a degree of probability. So if you have a lot of evidence for something, then you would say it has a high degree of probability, not certainty, but a high degree of probability that something would be true. Then we also have deductive reasoning. And that is essentially when we're reducing something down to where if A is true and B is true, then C must be true. So let me give you an example of that. If premise A is um, all men are mortal and premise B is Socrates is a man, then the conclusion C has to be that Socrates is mortal, right? Because if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then Socrates must be mortal, right? That's, that's, a, it, that's an example of a deductive argument. Now, can deductive arguments be wrong? Yes. If premise A is wrong or premise B is wrong, then your conclusion is going to be wrong, Right. So let's look at this idea of, first and foremost, do we have any evidence of God? And part of this question relies upon what do you consider to be evidence? Well, what I found interesting is that when I talk to a lot of atheists, they will say, well, I don't believe in God because there's no evidence for God. Like, well, okay, that's confusing to me. I think there's a lot of evidence for God. Why do you think there is none? Well, it's I, God's never appeared to me or God's never come out of the clouds or God's never done X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, well, but if you look at scripture, if you look at the Bible, Jesus claimed to be God. The prophets claimed to have seen God. That's, that's eyewitness testimony, right? That's, and of course, they'll immediately conclude, well, okay, well, yeah, but people hallucinate. People see things all the time. People make up stuff for their own benefit. Okay, fair, but your statement five seconds ago was there is no evidence for God. That because you haven't seen God or you haven't experienced God in a way that you find convincing, therefore nobody has. And what I'm pointing out is, is that you can claim that you don't find the evidence compelling. You can't claim there's no evidence. Do you think it's easier for people to come to the conclusion that there is a creator rather than there is a God? I think, well, the moment you talk about a creator, you're talking about somebody, you're talking about something with agency, mm-hmm essentially choosing to create, right? You're not just talking about a mathematical formula that resulted in something. You're talking about a, a, a being with agency that chooses to do something. That's essentially synonymous, you know, if you're talking about a creator of everything and God, you're, you know, at six and one, half a dozen and well, the there, other. Well, According to Richard Dawkins, it could have been aliens. <laughs> I mean, he did finally come to Well, there, there's a reason why there's a, we'll get into that a little bit later, but there's actually a reason why some atheists have kind of pivoted from this idea of a strict interpretation of what we might call Darwinian evolution versus some sort of other biological entity which seeded Earth with spores and that led to, you know, the evolution that we've witnessed. And and some of that has to do with mathematical concerns. My, um, I, I'm I'm not going to like go into the in, into the details, but like to your question, Hamilton. Um, I mean, I I think it's true. I actually kind of disagree with Nick too that. I mean, there there's theories out there to to say that there's a creator in the sense that there's like a first cause, right? To use you know the, the Aristotle language, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has like conscious agency. Well, but we want or intentionality. Really, but when we talk, so what I guess what I'm trying to say here is like we can nitpick the details, but when we say a creator, 
we we almost always associate that with something that has agency design. that creates. We don't yeah. we don't generally we we do. Yeah, but just most most of the population. Well, I, I don't think do they would use that term. I think what they would probably say, like so, for instance, let let's let's use the argument that intelligent life um, led to the life that we have here on Earth, and so usually what you'll see is that okay, even if we don't think we have a good biological. Um, or, or we'll say a, uh, an atheistic explanation for how life began on earth, how it evolved, how it got to its current state, they will then come to the conclusion that, okay, so an intelligent life must have been responsible for it, but then that intelligent life must be explained through ultimately purposeless and evolutionary forces, right? It, it wasn't some grand creator or God that called things into existence, Right. That's that's the very thing they're arguing against from an atheistic framework. So they might say that there was a, a, a point in time where things began to exist, obviously. Right. They might say that there were certain conditions and then a catalyst for which m that made life possible. But they wanted to assign it to some sort of creator being, if that makes sense or ultimate creator beating that explains all of it. Yeah, you, you get a bunch of weird stuff like the simulation hypothesis, which yeah. is just pure cope, honestly. It's, <laughs> it's, it's you know, Silicon Valley attempting to explain why the world exists, realizing the, the flaws within the atheistic model without wanting to actually, you know, go a step further. But I, to, to, I know where you're coming from. And so to answer that, I, I, I think it's much easier to argue in favor of a, a creator in the sense that that we actually think of it not not like spontaneous but that there was some sort of intentionality or purpose or meaning behind the creation of the universe than there is to a specific named deity and, and i think for a lot of people that struggle with religion they kind of struggle with the first questions even before they even get to yeah. the, the second one the reason i bring this up is because if we were to ask an individual is God real or, or, is it, or is it reasonable to think that there is a God, they might think in that situation that you're talking about an all-knowing being who is, you know, as the Bible would say, perfect and all-knowing. Um, but I think it's a lot more reasonable for many Americans to find it reasonable that there is a creator who created the planet. Okay, so that's a little bit different, right? That's still God. Mm -hmm. The question is, is, is it the God of Christianity? Right. Is it is it the God that the Bible claims is God? And and yeah, you see people um it, it's generally associated with like deism when it's when it's a right. non specific yep. God. People it's, will get to that point and then they just really struggle with now who is he? Well, because right? because one here and here's the problem, and this is the other reason when we talk about God, because when I talk about God, I'm talking about the Christian God. Other sure, people are talking sure. about different things. But here here's the other thing. The evidence for like when, when we talk about the sort of evidence is people claim to have seen God, right? People claim to have interacted with God. Now, if, if somebody showed up in a courtroom and was an eyewitness to an event that went on or an action that took place, you could either say, I agree with their testimony, or you could say, I disagree with their testimony, or you could say that they're lying or they're not. You could say any of that one, but you couldn't say that wasn't evidence presented, right? So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that, to say that there is no evidence actually suggests an incredible level of ignorance about Christian doctrine and what it actually believes, because it's not just it's not just theory; it's actually history. And and so much of scripture, much of what scripture is, is actually laying out historical events. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody that gets very upset, like, you know, oh, I, your your Christianity talks about morality and love, but then David cheated on, or David had his best friend murdered and stole his wife, like. Yeah, then that was a horrible thing, and he was punished, you know, very severely for it. Pointing something out is not the same as advocating for the thing that happened. In fact, one of the things that I find convincing when we look at scripture is that, you know, in, in a, and when we look at a lot of world religions, or when we look at a lot of things that you know men are making up, you know, myths or stories or whatnot, they they tend to create this perfect image of something, make themselves look good. Yeah, as, as opposed to laying out like all of the the warts and everything else. Yeah. But but the other thing too, and this goes to your point about okay, what does the absence of God mean? Right. So we have people saying, I saw God, God did this. I witnessed this X, Y, and Z. Maybe you believe it. Maybe you don't believe it. But what does the absence of God within the world actually mean? Well, it, what it means is, is that if there, if there is no being that actually created all of this, now you have to come to the conclusion that once upon a time there was nothing and then there was something 
and then there was an explosion or a big bang and you have the you have immaterial then you have material now we have stuff right but the the stuff is not alive and the stuff is unintelligent but then the stuff within a a very very specific environment, the earth, the primordial soup, whatever you want to call it, the various chemicals came together, right? Now, we don't know how the chemicals got there. We don't know how they came into existence, but they're just there now. They're just there now. We also don't know why do certain configurations of chemicals or atoms in a particular association or combination somehow creates conscious experience. Oh, it's, it's like, let's work it back there. We're not even a consciousness yet, right? We've got nothing. Then we've got material that is non-living then we have living material then we have conscious living material then we have intelligent material which is kind of like in in line with consciousness Mm -hmm. and then we have moral material Mm -hmm. right and and like and and by the way that's a very like i i know you're you're in you're also like intentionally oversimplifying it because if you dig into any of those those steps it gets even more complex like like at the matter stage i mean there there's all sorts of studies that have shown like you know well if you know the force of gravity was just changed by just a tiny bit amount right then all the material of the universe would have never even coalesced into galaxies and solar systems and planets it shouldn't be it shouldn't be and the fact that we have order and we have order in every everything everything um even Darwin himself really, really struggled. There's a quote um, where he, he struggled with, you know, everybody has to come up against this at some point. There's a struggle in believing that everything was an accident. And even Darwin himself said at one point, and I think it was toward the end, where like this is where he came up against it. The order was too much for him. It was too much for him to, to completely submit even to his own theory. Um, To suppose that the eye, with all of its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic um, aberration, sorry guys, old language, um, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Because the order is just... It's too much order to be able to explain it by accident. It's you. You would have to have so many series of accidents just to get to the very first little spark of life. Let alone, you know, the human eye that can adjust and focus and and do all of this. You know, and even not the human eye, e- any eye, obviously. Well, it's, it's important to understand that the, one of the ways that this has always been addressed has been time, right? Well, yeah, it happened over billions of years. You have, you have these you know, things that take place. And after all, look at how quick society has advanced within a relatively short period of time with the right conditions. And it's like, okay, yeah, but that was purposeful forces actually utilizing intelligence and the scientific method in order to achieve things. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about something that just hand them essentially purposelessly, which is to say that there wasn't some sort of creator dictating it. It was just response to stimuli over time. And it came to these conclusions. I, I want to read this out because this, this is interesting. It goes, um, Oxford University professor of mathematics, John Lennox, quotes uh, renowned Oxford University mathematical physicist Roger Penrose. And this was kind of the discussion on what is the probability? Because again, we're taking- I love Roger Penrose. We're, just we're, got to point that out. Yeah, we're taking God <laughs> out of the equation. So what does it mean if we take God out of the equation and now we have to explain something without God? And Roger Penrose says, try to imagine phase space of the entire universe. Each point in this phase space represents a different possible way that the universe might have started off. We are to picture the creator armed with a pen, which is to be placed at some point in phase space. Each different position of the pen provides a different universe. Now the accuracy that is needed for the creator's aim depends on the entropy of the universe that is thereby created. It would be relatively easy to produce a high entropy universe since then there would be a large volume of the phase space available for the pen to hit. But in order to start off the universe in a state of low entropy, so that there will indeed be a second law of thermodynamics, right, which governs a bunch of physics, the creator must aim for a much tinier volume of the phase space. How tiny would this region be in order that a universe closely resembling the one in which we actually lived would be the result? What he's essentially saying is that, again, if you you look at the opening, you know, 
picoseconds of the creation of the universe and whatnot, the, the degree of probability that it would produce one that would you know, have life, complex life, the way that we envision it, is incredibly small. Linux goes on to cite Penrose's answer. His calculations led him to the remarkable conclusion that the creator's aim, right, the, the probability that we would actually get the sort of universe that we have with life, must have been accurate to one part in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. That is one followed by 10 to the 123rd power zeros. I mean, as Penrose puts it, that is a number which it would be impossible to write out in the usual decimal way. Because even if you were able to put a zero on every particle in the universe, there would not even be enough particles to do the job. This is th this is the fine-tuning problem, which is such a big problem that it's it's um it's it's quite daunting to to many physicists like like um philip goth who's um a, a physicist he actually wrote a book last year titled why the purpose of the universe and goth was an, an atheist for a very long time and he's not a christian yeah. although he he does recognize that there's a lot of of positive contributions to christianity so he's one of those type of people that thinks that it carries a lot of value but um he wanted to write this book basically looking at some of these problems especially within like the fine tuning problem and what he ended up coming to was the the odds are just are just too great like like there he ended up writing an entire book basically where he refuted atheism within the book what he which he previously believed in because he he ultimately concluded that there there had to have been i i can't tell you the specifics or why or who did it or anything like that but there has to have been a reason there, there has to have been a reason because the odds are so minute that it would be the equivalent of you, you know, going into a ca casino and you you run through every single slot machine and you get the max payout every single time, right? And the the counter argument that you get from people like Dawkins actually on the fine tuning problem is quite interesting because somebody like Dawkins will say, um, "Well, you have the multiverse. Yeah, that's that that has to be the answer." <laughs> But this, you know, there, there's an well, analogy how much more that, faith it, does that it, take? it turns out Disney Marvel is not the only one using the multiverse to try to explain and, all the contradictions. And there's, yeah, there's, <laughs> basically you, you're having to to now create more complexity because you have to say that there's an infinite number of universes in order to explain why this one exists. That still doesn't explain why do we live in this one. And then somebody says, well, of course, you have to be aware of the fact that we live in a universe in order for it's the anthropic principle, right? That, yeah. that you know, well, only in a universe that could create the conditions for life to exist can we pontificate about the odds of life existing? Well, there's a problem with this. And, and the, the analogy is the firing squad analogy. And it goes like this. You're, you're lined up against a wall. Let's say the revolution happens and the woke commies win and we're all lined up against the wall, right? <laughs> so you're lined up against the wall and the firing squad, you know, gives the order to fire and everybody pulls the trigger. And suddenly you just realized you're still standing. And then you ask, why am I still standing? Why am I not dead? And then one of the people who was pulling the trigger says, well, that's a dumb question to ask. If you were dead, you wouldn't be asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost that like doesn't, you, you know the problem there, right? Yeah. That does not explain why you're still standing. Yeah. Of course, if you were dead, you wouldn't be asking the question, but that does not explain why you survived the firing squad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, it, it, it does not explain anything. And, and by the way, I did not bring up, well, by the way, there's, there's other views of how the universe works. They, uh, they, let, let me just say, this is a topic for a future episode, yeah. but but there's there's some big problems with the multi big problems with the multiverse theory. Well, so, and, I, and I think again, the, and the 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 very very moderate goal we're trying to reach through this episode is just to kind of you know discuss whether or not okay is this is this as unreasonable as some people make it out to be. So again, one of the consequences of of not having a, a creator for all of this is that the universe as we currently understand it becomes not just mathematically improbable, but as close to impossible as we can possibly understand or grasp it because of all of the various things that have to happen just so and just perfectly and then have to maintain that status in order for this to happen. And to, and to Christian's point, it's not good enough to say, well, the only way you can ask that question is because those things exist. So clearly those things had to exist. No. The other option is, is none of us exist. <laughs> so it, it, it makes sense to ask the question, not to mention the fact that if someone had shot at you, right? And and you were still alive in, in conditions where they should have hit you, whether you should have died as a result of it, your automatic conclusion would not be, well, this had to happen because I'm here to ask the question. You would be like, 
well, no, they, there was something wrong with the gun or it wasn't loaded or they missed because the guy's a bad shot or the guy felt some sort of moral tinge and decided he didn't want to hit. Like you, your mind would go through that. It wouldn't go to the conclusion of like, well, this is the only possible outcome that could have existed because I'm here to answer the, ask the question. Can I also bring up that like, there's other problems with this like scientism or materialism approach that that so many atheists bring to the table, like Hume, for example. I, 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 I was reading through the quote that you read off at the beginning of the show, and there's something at the very beginning of his quote that refutes it in addition to the way that you were refuting it earlier, where he says, if we take in, you know, in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, he's attacking metaphysics, which is really interesting because you literally cannot do science without metaphysics. In fact, you can't do almost anything without metaphysics. Well, and, and again, that's we're, we're going to kind of get to that point here in a little bit. But um, let, let's talk about some of the other things that become very, very difficult without God. And this is something that a lot of times, um, you know, a, again, atheists will confront us on and, and we'll, we'll talk about things like objective morality. And their, their response a lot of times is because we will make the claim that, well, without God, how can you have objective truth or objective morality? And they'll say, well, that's ridiculous. I don't need God to tell me not to murder. I'm not saying you need God to tell you not to murder. You need to explain why murdering is not, why it is morally wrong. And usually they'll come up with some sort of like utilitarian response. Well, if I murder them, then someone else might murder me. Like, okay, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong? I'm not asking you why it doesn't work well within society. I'm asking you, why is it wrong? Why is it wrong on some sort of fundamental moral level that even if you can come up with certain, you know, utilitarian justifications for it, we would still say that was wrong. You should not have murdered that innocent person. And the answer is, is that when, when they become, when they get very honest about it, and some of them are, they'll say, well, it's not about morality. There is no objective morality. It's not wrong in some sort of cosmic moral sense that I kill that person. It's just not useful to me. Okay, well, that has some pretty significant implications for the way we look at things like justice, right? Because justice is not saying you shouldn't do something because it's not good for you. Justice is a direct implication. It's a direct appeal to some sort of moral authority that goes beyond your individual preferences, and so sometimes I'll, I'll see people say things like, well, it's, it's because it's the law and because we democratically elected our lawmakers and they can't. Okay. So if your democratically elected lawmakers decided that it was okay to own other human beings and beat them, if they don't work for you, you're fine with that. You have no moral qualms with it. Well, no, I do. But your democratically elected leaders came to that conclusion so that, again, if you still have a problem with it, you can't come to the conclusion that that's the ultimate source for morality. You know, the, the, again, it's the, the political society idea that if the political society is determined that this is moral, it's moral. No, politicians get to decide what's legal and illegal. They don't get to decide what's moral and immoral. Not in any sort of objective sense. And, th and this poses a real problem. Now, again, some atheists will come to the conclusion, well, it doesn't pose any problem at all. We, we determine that certain things are better for the advancement of civilization, and therefore we do those things. It's like, okay, but again, the problem for that is as soon as somebody else comes along and decides that you not being here is good for the advancement of civilization, you can say, I don't like that. You can say, I don't find it very useful for me, but you don't get to say that it's objectively morally wrong. And so therefore this concept of justice that you put forward means is meaningless. It's meaningless. It's just, a, it's essentially might makes right. Whoever has the most power to impose their will at any given time is, is the moral actor in the relationship. This is why you rapidly get to nihilism yes. within an atheistic framework. There's, there's a lot of people that Im implicitly know that regardless of their theological positions, but I don't think that they necessarily appreciate why it, it's so common. Like a a atheism breeds nihilism by definition. Certainly materialism does. I mean, I would yeah. argue that also atheism, but like it, it breeds nihilism by definition because there, there it, it's not that there's no way for you to sort out what's right and wrong. It's that there is no such thing as right and as wrong. right and wrong. That's that's the paradigm shift that I don't think people, you know, understand. They look at it as, well, wait a second, I'm nice to people. I don't murder people. I help the poor. In fact, I help the poor more than you Christians claim to do it. By the way, that's not true. Well, no, I know it's not true. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that okay, but that 
Unfortunately, that doesn't actually help your argument. I, I'm glad that you're behaving in moral ways. What I'm saying is, is that you don't have any ultimate justification for it other than you find it useful or preferential. And, and I, I had somebody once tell me they were very upset when I brought up this point. And they said, oh, if you didn't have God, you'd be around. You'd, so you just go murder and raping people. No, but I still wouldn't be able to explain why those things were wrong, just like you can't. And she finally got so frustrated when she goes, I'll tell you what my morality is. My morality is that if I know if I'm a good person and I can look at myself in the mirror and know that I'm helping people, then, then that is, then that is, that's what's moral. And I said, well, that sounds a little bit sociopathic. And she said, do you even know what a sociopath is? I said, yes, a sociopath is someone that can justify anything that they do, provided that they can look at themselves in the mirror and believe that they're a good person. Right. That's ultimately what, what, when we're talking about sociopath, we're talking about someone that can essentially justify their own actions because for them in their world on what they defined as moral or right or just, they met the threshold. And there is no objective threshold outside of them saying that this is wrong or this is right. There's, there, there's, I mean, remember when I brought up the metaphysics thing, I, I was kind of jumping the gun because it's, <laughs> and Nick's over here, like nodding his head. Yes, Christian, you're jumping the gun. <laughs> um, no, he's right. And, and I was wrong, but like the, the reason I brought that up was because it, I, I, I think that it's intertwined with, with the idea of objective morality, because it's not, remember, remember when I said that, you know, it's, it's not that you can't just divide good from evil it's that you the, the things don't even exist as concepts no. No. within a materialistic or atheistic framework I, in in some ways objective reality itself does not exist in everything within it and and here's what i mean if everything is just a combination of atoms just pieced together in a, in a particular way and that's all you know to quote carl sagan you know that's all that the universe you know all that it is is the universe you know ever was is or will be right then things that that we we kind of take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives, regardless of what your religion is or your theological disposition, they, they they don't exist. And what I what I mean is things like logic and reason and objective truth and morality and consciousness for that matter. Like like the, these things that we don't really think about when we're going about our lives. We just again, we just take them for granted as existing. Under an atheistic framework, they don't exist. They're either illusions or they don't actually have any sort of objective standalone position yeah, in, they're, in, they're, in, in objective existence. They're not authoritative in the sense that they exist regardless of, of how we feel about them. Yes. And and and, and, and they're honestly, at best useful fictions. Yes. And at worst, they don't exist at all. Yeah. Yeah. They're, well, they're 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 um they're artificial. They're just something that we created to make ourselves either feel better or to achieve certain outcomes or whatnot. And I think that's the thing that, that people need to come to grips with is that when, when we look at, you know, is it reasonable to believe in God? Well, again, when I look at Christianity and I look at the evidence presented out in scripture, I find scripture to be sound. I find the evidence that's presented within scripture to be I, I think it makes sense. I think it's reasonable. I think you have eyewitnesses. I think you have people that made certain decisions based off of what they did that seemed to make sense if Jesus was who he claimed to be, right? I see all of that. And I, I look at that. I'm like, that all seems to be inductive reasoning. That seems to be a lot of evidence. But the other thing I look at it is, okay, it, it, is our universe, is it more probable that our universe is fine-tuned or not fine-tuned? Well, I would say it's infinitely more probable that it is fine-tuned. Right? It, is, it, is it probable that objective morality, is it objectively bad to murder a small child and eat them? Is that objectively bad? I, I would say it is. I would say it's objectively bad to do that. Right? Okay, if you believe that too, then you need to come to the conclusion that it can only be objectively immoral if there's some sort of lawgiver which says that it's objectively immoral regardless of any justification, regardless of any evolutionary justification. You can come up with that, right? It doesn't matter. It's wrong. It's right. wrong because something is so inherent about that act that, that nothing can justify it. Now, if you don't believe that, if you think, well, no, you know, there might be some conditions where it's perfectly okay to do something like this because you felt like it, right? We're not even talking about you know, a, a horrible scenario where you're, you know, in a survival situation, right? I still think it would be wrong. We're just talking about like, it was cloudy on a Tuesday and you didn't have anything in the, in the pantry. And, and when people ask like, why are you using such an extreme example? Because extreme example 
extreme examples provide evidence of, of a fundamental truth. Because if we're talking about the very existence of objective morality, then I want to give you the most extreme example possible so you can sit there and think to yourself, okay, am I really prepared to say, well, no, I I may not prefer that, but if somebody else did it, I couldn't say they were morally wrong? Because if you're saying morality doesn't exist, then if somebody did that right in front of you, you'd have to come to the conclusion, I don't like it, maybe, I don't find it useful, maybe, but you couldn't say it was objectively wrong. And if you're willing to accept a universe on something like that, that's a pretty that's a pr- pretty scary thing. I mean, I see people take making an allowances for entire civilizations that operated that way. Sure. You know, where they they did human sacrifice, they ate people, they yeah. hunted down people and ate them. Um, and you know, now the way things are framed up, they'll make it sound like we are the absolute worst for stopping all of that from happening. So I do kind of get to the point where it's like, because Christianity came into various places uh, through missionaries and things like that. And you've seen the meme, right, Tina? And the, 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 the Aztec meme where it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, they're chopping the heart out and then and it's like, oh, look, here comes the far right. And it's yeah. like the Spanish. It's Cortez. Well, it's <laughs> not even just that. It's also like Christianity. I mean, basically our mandate is to go and share what mm-hmm. we know and what we believe because it's true. And so um, you're where Christians will look at it as we are, you know, as basically the hands and feet of Christ to go and rescue these people out of this, this uh, belief system, which is ultimately uh, not true and ultimately in worship to something other than God. And, and so, um, you know, we do see that, get left to their own devices societies won't always come up with stuff that the rest of us feel are moral now and so um i i i think that you know it happening right in front of you might give you more of a sense of urgency but there's a lot of people that are just accepting of the fact that this happened you know tina it's even worse than that like avowed atheistic societies state atheistic societies have have done it, it, it it's it's not that oh look at what can be permitted look at what happens when you have societies that are supposedly built around rationality and scientism i mean the first quasi atheistic society was was the one that the french revolution produced and they started chopping people's heads off because they were the wrong type of revolutionary well i i want to i want to i want to rein this in a little bit right because Again, somebody is going to instantly come back like, okay, we'll look at these so-called Christian societies that did X, Y, and Z. The difference, the difference is, is that within that Christian society, you can point back to scripture and say, but that, that policy posed a contradiction to what scripture said to do. You may have done it in the name of this, but you can't find justification for what you did here. The, The point that we're trying to make is that in a society where essentially There is no objective morality. And by objective morality, I don't mean the majority voted for it. I don't mean the majority of people find it useful or culturally acceptable. I mean objective, right or wrong, because there is a there is a higher being which says this is right and this is wrong. In a society you don't have that, you can essentially ultimately justify anything. Mm -hmm. Right? Which is why you had ancient societies that sacrificed their children to to ball in order to try to get a better crop. Right. And, and, and you can even make, you can even make modern day comparisons. You can make modern day comparisons for the things that we sacrifice or we accept or we allow to take place in order to justify our own preferences. Right. So it's not as if morality goes away. It's that objective morality, right? That, that which is beyond ourselves and which we are required to conform to, that's what goes away and it gets replaced with subjective morality. And so again, whether you want to whether you want to believe in God or not, at least understand the implications of not believing in God, because you don't get to just simply claim, well, no, no, there, there's still morality, and this morality is just a good. In fact, I think it's better. It's like, no, this is subjective. This is objective. Your worldview does not allow for objective morality, and honest atheists will admit this. Well, yeah, not having the God of the Bible, basically. Um, It's a huge problem because if you're just saying that society will stumble upon what is good and and inevitably just get there on their own, 
um, that is to deny that people have ultimately a sinful nature. People, there is something dark within people uh, because without God, there is no light. No. And so this idea that, that we could stumble upon what is moral all on our own and get there on our own is, it's absurd. Well, let's, so, let's, so let's look at this. So the first question was, is it reasonable to believe in God? And, and we kind of offered two examples. One was, again, anybody that claims that there's no evidence, again, for the God of the Bible, is apparently not aware of the Bible or not aware of evidence. Again, it's one thing to say, I don't find the evidence convincing. It's not the same to say it doesn't exist because you don't like it, right? Or you don't find it convincing. The other part of this is about understanding the implications of what happens when you remove God from the, the equation. And I think that's something that isn't properly understood sometimes when we have this debate. People have this idea. The, the example I use a lot is um, when they say, well, you know, again, I don't believe in God, and yet I act morally. I'm like, well, I don't know how, I'm, I can't tell you the intricacies of how an internal combustion engine works, but I can drive a car just fine. But if I come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as an internal combustion engine because I know how to drive a car, right, I'm going to find out when the engine stops working that that wasn't true. You just created an analogy that explains the world that we're currently living in, the post-Christian West yeah. that we're incur that, that we're increasingly living in. Like the analogy that I have is is if if you go on Twitter, sorry X, <laughs> if you go on on X and you look at like Richard Dawkins' feed, you see some interesting stuff because recently, and when I say recently, I really mean over the past couple of years or so, he's he's come out as a big critic of of postmodernism, wokeism, modern day progressivism. I mean, he he's tweeted things like, look, as a biologist, there's very few things that exist within, you know, nature that are binaries. Sex is one of them. And and he's criticizing the woke idea that again, like gender is yeah. is fluid and that there's, you know, a spectrum and that there is no such thing as a binary. And he's also criticizing increasingly, you also have within wokeism things that criticize the, you know, like the scientific method, saying that it's a you know, it's a symbol of white, you know, supremacy and and that it's a, you know, colonialist structure or whatever. And so he's criticizing these things. But what he doesn't seem to appreciate <laughs> is the source behind all of them because what what he's doing is is that he's saying i want the benefits of the society that we previously lived in that produced all of these things but i i don't want to give credit to the source or the author of all these things well okay when you tore the foundation of the house out from underneath it why on earth are you surprised when the walls start crumbling down around you i I, I say this because your analogy with the car in some ways explains so many topics that we've discussed on this podcast that are related to culture or politics or society at large, because there's a lot of people out there that don't seem to understand, well, why do we live in this age of nihilism and disillusion? And why do, you know, why is there rampant mental illness and narcissism and, and personality disorders and, and just, you know, clown world? Why is everybody losing their minds? It's because we live in a in a post Christian West. That's the yeah, reason why. Everybody's you're gonna worship something, mm -hmm. right? And if you tear out the thing that that held the, the 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 bonds that held society together, and it was the Christian Church for over a thousand years, arguably for two thousand years in the West. If you tear that away, away, guess what? The atheists out there who say that we're all just going to become a bunch of enlightened beings once you throw out this mumbo jumbo book from the Bronze Age, they were wrong. They were dead wrong because people did not become enlightened. You know what they did? They became barbarians when you threw this out. This is how you get things like these pseudo cults emerging. Wokeism is a religion. It's a replacement to Christianity. As I've said before, it's a religion without a Christ figure with no redemption arc. But it, it's it's trying to keep the vestiges, the vestiges of Christianity with its own morality system, with its oppressor versus oppressed dynamics, but it provides you for for no redemption. It provides you for 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 no meaning or purpose, no hope. And so, what we've seen is not a a return to rationality. What you've seen is a is an abandonment of rationality, well, an abandonment like, of science. It's like a turning inward and and more uh, worshiping self. Uh, I think that the the Anything and everything you see right now, whether it's any t any type of advertisement, it's all about whatever makes you happy. What you know, your own. Everything is self focused. And what's interesting is, and I think Jordan Peterson talks about this sometimes, is uh, 
uh, the more we look at ourself, uh, the more the more we mess ourselves up because we're so obsessed with that and we've got our eyes on ourselves. Well, and there's yeah, Theodore Dalrymple, who's again the pen name for I think it's Doctor Anthony Dan- Daniels. Um, he talks about this as well when he was, and he's an atheist, right? Or he's at least an agnostic. And, and when, when he, he was a, a, a psychiatrist and he used to tell his patients, like one of the biggest problems that they had, it's, it's one of the reasons why he's very, very anti kind of woke and socialism and, and the Marxist theory is, uh, is because of all that inward focused on, you know, talk about your feelings and how, you know, you feel about this and how you want this and what are your objectives. And, and he actually finally came to the conclusion, he's like, if, if you really want to attain some degree of sanity and, and, and happiness, you actually have to look outside yourself, not be constantly focused inward. And you're seeing the same thing with, oh, I can't remember her name. Um, she, she's also, I, b- I believe, a psychiatrist. I can't remember her name, but she just she just talked about this as well. She's like, you know, we're living in a time where we've never been more aware of, of trauma and never had more access to therapy. And, and yet there seems to be more and more problems associated with this. And, and people mocked her and said, well, yeah, that's because there's a problems. And, and, you know, you claiming that the, the solution isn't working is ridiculous because obviously if there's problems, you're going to have to have people, you know, taking medications and going through therapy. And she's like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm saying that the more attention that we focused on it and the more we've made the therapy about in, internalizing everything and, and your issues and your trauma and your everything and your this and your that, yeah. the worse off people get. Well, because it, I look at it and a lot of it is assigning blame at this point and it's never blaming yourself. It's always blaming outside forces. And so I feel like we are to a point where it, typically people... In this area, they worship themselves. When you are your only focus, when you are the only thing that you care about, then then you are what you worship. Yeah, you know what people are trying to do? They're trying to become the Ubermensch. Well, okay, we're not going. <laughs> we're not going down the Nietzsche route yet. We're not going down the Nietzsche route yet. All right, listen, we need to move on to the next thing here. So we've talked about some of the implications about what happens if God doesn't exist. Now we're going to get into a little bit more specific with respect to things like. Christianity. So for instance, one of the other things that people will talk about, right, is they'll say, is it really reasonable to believe a book with dozens of authors that was written thousands of years ago and written over thousands of years? And and they'll they'll usually use this analogy with a telephone game, right? Like you go into a kindergarten class and you you whisper something into one kid's ear and they whisper yeah. it, and by the time it gets to the end, it's something completely different or ridiculous. And they'll say, so just like that, obviously, over so much time and over so much interpretation, things isn't it reasonable to believe that things could have gotten lost in translation and that the Bible that you go and pick up at the store right now bears very little resemblance to whatever was written thousands of years ago? And the thing is, is let's make this clear. It is, it's not unreasonable to assume that that could have happened. Yeah, but you would also have to assume there are no old documents. Well, well, we, but let's let's work it back here. Okay. It's not unreasonable to assume that a book with several authors and really several books, right? Because the, yeah. the Bible is not just one book it's as much as books. it is sixty six books, right? Between the the Jewish Old Testament and then the the New Testament. Um, and so let, let's read about this just a little bit. Like, can it? Can you? Before we get into can you trust what the Bible says? Let's at least ask the reasonable question of. Is the Bible that you're reading today, is the one that you go and pick up, the, the English Standard Version, I'll, I'll, and not the I'm, people get all upset about ver- versions. If you go pick up an ESV Bible right now, can you be relatively certain that when you open up the book of Proverbs, or when you open up the book of Matthew, or when you open up the book of Revelations, or whatever it is, right? When you open up the book of, of um, Psalms, is it going to be close to what was actually originally written. Well, not, right? not just close, but essentially have the same meaning. Yes. And, and so that's what we're talking about. So let, let's, let's go through that and ask because it's not unreasonable to assume that things could have gotten lost in translation it happens all the time. All right. right. Because wording, wording can be different, but still mean the same. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to get into that. The Bible was written over a span of 1500 years by 40 writers. Unlike other religions, writings, or, or like other, other religious writings or a lot of religious writings, the Bible reads as a factual news account of real events, places, people, and dialogue. Historians and archeologists have repeatedly confirmed its authenticity. Now here's what they mean by that, right? There are some religious books which are maybe the utterances of an individual prophet or an individual you know person or, or a guru or whatever it is. There's other ones that that talk about things that that people are not necessarily purporting to have taken place, right? It's it's very mystical, 
Um, or it's Gnostic in the sense that it's some sort of special knowledge that only the believers possess, which means it's stuff that cannot effectively be falsified, right? There, there's not there's not things that we can go back. When we look at the Bible, much of the Bible, some of the Bible is poetry, right? Some of the Bible is prophecy. Some of the Bible is history. Some of the Bible is law. There's a lot of things that we can go back and and you could point to and you could say, well, okay, if the Bible says X, Y, and Z and, and history or, or what we know of it deliberately contradicts everything it's saying, that would be very problematic for the Bible, right? We, we can acknowledge that. And so one of the things that we look at here on, on archaeology is many of the ancient locations mentioned, like say by the book of, of Luke and the book of Acts and the New Testament have been identified through archaeology. In all, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without error. Right. So once again, this would be a fairly easy part to where we could go in and we could say, all right, well, the Luke of Bo- or the book of Luke says X, Y, and Z, but you know, that was wrong. That, that country never, never existed. Right. And it's, it's not like a mistranslation. Never. He made up a mythical place. He's talking about Atlantis out here. That's not going on. The other thing that we end up finding out is archeology span has also uh, refuted many ill-founded theories about the Bible. For example, a theory still taught in some colleges day asserts that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because writing had not been invented in his day. Then archeologists discovered the black steel, uh, stele it had a wedge shaped characters on it and contained the detailed laws of Hammurabi. Was it post Moses? No, it was pre mosaic. Not only that, but it was also pre Abraham. It preceded Moses's writing by at least three centuries. So again, there, there's been things that people have attempted to look at and say, well, this can't be this because of this. And then archaeology, you, you see this with the existence of the Hittite civilization. There right. was, for the longest time, they didn't believe that there was any such thing as a Hittite civilization. The Bible just made it up. And then archaeology came forward and said, well, no, actually, we know quite a bit about the Hittite civilization right. now. Well, archaeology basically had to catch up with uh, what the Bible said well, because the, they they discovered things later that refuted what, uh, what they had originally thought. You know what's interesting? It. Uh, three years ago, there was – because I, I remember growing up, I would hear examples of, like, the, the Hittites being the most prominent example yeah. that that other Christians would tell me as, as proof of the authenticity of the Bible. But there, there's, there's two things that I learned r- really over the last, like, five years or so. One is um, ancient sources are really scarce. Um, oh, yeah. Really scarce. Like, it's, it's over 90%, possibly 99%. And that's not an exaggeration of ancient sources are lost to us. Yeah. Um, for example, the earliest source that we have on one of the most famous people to have ever existed, Alexander the Great, was written about 200 years after he died. So that would be the equivalent of me writing something about James Madison, about his life, his career, everything. And then 2,000 years later historians citing me talking about James Madison as proof of James Madison's life and career as being accurate. And, and we take that for granted, right? Nobody questions the existence of James Madison or, you know, Madison. No, likewise, nobody questions the existence of Alexander. Nobody questions that he conquered the Persian empire, that he founded these cities or, or that, you know, he had seven bodyguards and we know their names and, and, Nobody really questions that, despite the fact that we don't even think about that often, the fact that the sources that we have on hand about the career and life of Alexander were written 200 years after he was dead. Well, let's... And let's that, that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. The second thing is, um, so going back to the Hittite example, there's another example um, that doesn't really get a lot of, of um, traction, but um, there was an, an archaeological dig in this... Um, this place uh, called uh, Tal El Haman, and it's um it's it's near the Jordan River, um, close to the Dead Sea, and what they um ended up concluding, and there was this paper that was published in I think it was like September twenty twenty one, and uh, what this uh, paper ended up concluding, um, was that a a Tunguska sized comet or asteroid had an airburst over these Bronze Age villages near the the Jordan River. Over like 3,000 years ago and that it wiped out, you know, like it was like two or three of these like Bronze Age cities. 
And in the very end of the paper, and it was talking about, you know, all the dig sites that they did and they, they, you know, determined that, you know, there was like sand that got turned to glass and stuff like that. You know, it was almost like a nuclear explosion. Right. And so they were like, you know, based on all this evidence, you know, from years of digging, we concluded that, again, it was like a Tunguska event over a populated area that took yeah. place around this time. And then at the very end of the paper, they, they wrote something in there. They were like, this is outside the scope of what we're doing here. But we just want to point out that th there might actually be a source about this that yeah. appears in, in ancient records. There's no and then they concluded that there's no ancient source, no, no written record anywhere outside of one passage within Genesis that that might correlate to this event. Yeah. And they're talking about Sodom and, Sodom Gomorrah. and, Gomorrah. and Gomorrah. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring that up because that's actually very recent. This was like within the last three or four years. Oh, it, 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 it is. Like, let, let's look at two things. Like, let's, let's look at, so one of the things that we look at when we look at a source and, and, and an ancient text is we look at things like early attestation. And so early attestation is what Christian was talking about before, where it's what are the earliest copies that you have that were written or produced at the time that the events were actually taking place. And obviously when you're talking about antiquity, there's, there's, it's easy for, it's not like they were storing it all on an external hard drive somewhere, right? Like you were, you had times where you had the great library of Alexandria that, that, that burns down and we lose all kinds of information about antiquity. Um, so I want to read a little bit here just to provide some, um, Comparison. So the accuracy of today's Old Testament was confirmed in 1947 when archaeologists found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Along with today's West Bank and Israel, the Dead Sea Scrolls contained Old Testament scriptures dating a thousand years older than any manuscripts we had. When comparing the manuscripts at hand with these from a thousand years earlier, we find agreement 99.5% of the time and the 0.5% differences are minor spelling variances and sentence structure that doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. So here's what this means. If you were reading your Old Testament Bible, if you're reading the Old Testament, um, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the earliest attestation that we had for some of these documents were a thousand years after the fact. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, how accurate can this possibly be? Right? And then all of a sudden we find something that dates back to a, a, a thousand years earlier. Because again, when we're talking about the Old Testament, we're, we're talking about you know sources that were we're talking about events taking place within the Bronze Age, right? This is this is in, you know fifteen hundred BC um, in that in that time frame. Yeah, in that in that generalized time frame, right? So we're old stuff, and then all of a sudden we find documents and we compare the documents that were written, you know, a thousand years earlier and with ours. And all of a sudden we find 95.5% accuracy between the text with the 0.5% representing minor spelling that doesn't change the subject of the text. That, that is the best early attestation that we have, I think, of any book in antiquity. Now, what's interesting is regarding the New Testament, it is humanity's most reliable ancient document. All ancient manuscripts were written on papyrus, which didn't have much of a shelf life. So people hand copied originals to maintain the message and circulate it to others. So to give you an idea, right? And this is now we're talking about New Testament. So we've already established that when we look at books in antiquity, the Old Testament through the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot has a great deal of early attestation and a great deal of consistency between what was originally written and what we have right now. So when we look at the New Testament, though, what do we say there? All right, so this is where we go into the other contemporary works. I got some data here. I want it. Few people doubt Plato's writing of the Republic. It's a classic written by Plato around 380 BC. The earliest copies we have of it are dated 900 AD, which is a 1,300-year time lag from when he wrote it. There are only seven copies in existence from that time period, right? Caesar's Gaelic Wars were written about 100 to 44 BC. The copies we have today are dated a thousand years after he wrote it. We have 10 copies. When it comes to the New Testament, written between 50 and 100 AD, there are more than 5,000 copies. All are within 50 to 225 years of the original writing. Further, when it came to scripture, scribes, monks, were meticulous in their copying of original manuscripts. They checked and rechecked their work to make sure it perfectly matched. What the New Testament writers originally wrote is preserved better than any other ancient manuscript. We can be more certain of that than we of what we read about Jesus' life and words than we are certain of the writings of Caesar, Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. And they actually provide a, a, a series of books here with the Iliad, uh, Herodotus, Thucydides, or Thucydides, I always screw that up. Plato, uh, Demosthenes, whatever. Demosthenes, Demosthenes, uh, 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 Tacitus, uh, Pliny. Uh, it, so, it, like, there's no comparison. There's even more. Arian. Well, um, let, let's give let's give an a, let's give a couple examples here, right? So, Caesar's, Caesar's the Gaelic Wars, uh, 
Originally written between 144 BC. No, no, that that's when he lived. Oh, sorry, was sorry. Uh, the, well, they're, they're talking about the earliest manuscripts written, right? So this is the earliest copy we have is 900 years after the fact. Um, the the time the time gap between when it would when it would have been originally written and the earliest manuscript we have is a uh, thousand years, and the number of manuscripts that we have that are a thousand years after the fact is ten. Right. So I, I just use that one. We could also, again, we could go into the same thing with, with Plato and everyone else. What you're going to generally find is you're going to find a time gap of anywhere between 400 to 1400 years between when it was actually written and the earliest manuscript we have. And the total number of manuscripts that we have at that point, like the best one is, is Homer's Iliad, right? So you have a 400 year time gap from when it was written 800 BC to the earliest copy we have, we have 643 copies. When you go to the New Testament, right, it's 50 years from when the actual events took place and when, when or excuse me, 50 years from when the original authors, and we have 5,366 manuscripts Remember, that fit within that 50 to 225 year process. When I was bringing up the Alexander example, I, the reason I brought that up is for the same reason that, that you listed all these other works, because there's... No, nobody questions the authenticity of his of his career, despite the fact that the sources that we have were written hundreds of years after he was born. And obviously they were citing other people, right? Yeah. You know, like Arian is citing other people because he was born centuries after the fact. Um, same thing with Diodorus, who was the only one that actually wrote a history of Alexander that we still have today in in the first century BC rather than post-Christ. But even then, that was 200 years after Alexander was born. And he's the earliest one. Yeah. And and then, you know, so, so the counter argument is, oh, well, you know, they're all citing other sources that are more close to the contemporary time period. That's true. But there is no debate over the authenticity of the of the documents themselves. Yeah. The reason I bring this up is because when you look at the books of, of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, we have way more material to work with here over a much shorter period of time than we do so many other major historical events that we are lucky to still have with us today. Yeah. Remember, it's overwhelming majority of ancient sources have been totally lost to us that we will never have access to. Every now and then they'll discover something. Very rarely, every now and then. I think it was actually um, uh, in the past like 100 years or so that we discovered a famous speech from Demosthenes during yeah. the, the war where Athens was fighting Macedon after Alexander's death. Um, spoiler alert, that was a terrible decision that they made. But um, we actually did a Y minute on it. Um, but the what what's so fascinating about the the gospels is that they were written within one lifespan, yeah. within within just a few generations of of the actual events that they're recounting. Well, and, and that's the, the larger point here is again, keeping in theme with this, what are we talking about? We're not saying, all right, now, I, again, I believe the Gospels. I'm not saying you have to believe the Gospels. What I'm saying, and I'm not saying that we've proved the Gospels are, are um, that, that everything written in the Gospel taken place. I'm not claiming we've proven that. What we have said, though, is that, is it reasonable to believe that a book written thousands of years ago can be accurate? And the answer is, yes, it is reasonable. Because if, if you're willing to say, if, if, if you're trying to use a test of authenticity and you're trying to apply that test to the Bible and you don't think the Bible meets your test, no book in antiquity does, right? You got to throw out every book in antiquity. Now, if you're willing to do that, you can, but just understand something. You, you haven't made a reasonable argument. You, you've essentially created a test for which nothing can really stand up except for stuff that was you know, written fairly modern. And, and the, the problem with that is that, again, when, when you're looking at, again, I'm not making an argument that everything said in Scripture is true. I believe that, but I'm not making that argument right here. I'm simply making that argument that you can't reasonably claim that the Bible has not done a good job of, of actually keeping consistency with what was written in the original manuscripts versus what we have today. You cannot make that claim because we have overwhelming evidence that it is an accurate um, translation throughout time. We have, I'm sorry, it is. Again, if you want to reject it on other levels, fine. But if you're going to try to reject it on this point, I'm going to come to the conclusion you're not being reasonable with respect to the way that we actually determine these things. To that point, um, is there a way we could put a link in the uh, in this recording, uh, beneath this recording, to uh, what is the gal's name that wrote her thesis? Emily Orr Ewing. Yes. Yeah, Emily, Emily Orr Ewing actually wrote her... Um, 
wrote her an entire thesis that you could you could um, reliably believe or, or you could re- reliably trust that the um, that the New Testament, the Gospels, um, were that that the authors that that what we have in the in the in the New Testament, what we have in the Gospels, that the authors were were uh, faithfully recording either what they saw or what they heard through eyewitness accounts, and that what was written in there could be um, again reasonably relied upon to be accurate. Um, and again, her, her initial professor who was something of an avowed atheist essentially gave her a, a pretty poor, uh, grade on her thesis. And she actually, I, I forget what they called it at Oxford, but it's a process where essentially, um, like, I, I think it's something like most of the, um, you know, professors within a particular field of study or whatnot will come and, and verbally question and quiz you. You have on to it. defend the thesis. Yeah, you have to defend your thesis. And it doesn't happen a lot, right? You you have ones we have to write your paper, but you don't have a lot of times where you have to defend it against the department heads. And and she ended up receiving the highest score possible after defending her thesis. And and what she ended up being told was that her work actually destroyed the life work of her grading professor, who had essentially said that that the gospels could not be relied upon. So Nick I, I think that the next logical question that anybody who's listening to this podcast, let alone somebody who doesn't believe Christianity, would have is, okay, you've made the argument that, you know, the Gospels or the New Testament is historically accurate insofar as it says what it says yeah. and, and nobody's lying, right? They're making these claims, just like all these other works, you know, Caesar and, and sure. you know, sure. all these other people, right? But that doesn't mean that I have to believe the content that's within them. Right. So how, you know, because for all of it, all the faults with the the time gap and stuff like that, at no point do, you know, does Arian claim that Alexander flew around, yeah, right? Or yeah. that, that he performed Rose miracles or, or, you know yeah. what I mean? And so, and so the claims within the works of, you know, these other famous figures like Caesar or Alexander are a lot different than the claims of Jesus. So we can, we can appreciate the, the historicity, yes. but the claims within it, how I, I I can't believe the miracles. Yeah, the truth claims, right? So the miracles is good. This is something David Hume wrote a lot about. He had a huge problem with any sort of text that referred to miracles, and he actually thought that the reference to miracles alone was something that undermined the value of the text in the first place. And and on the face of it, that doesn't seem unreasonable, right? If somebody if somebody was writing a book about World War II and they claimed that Hitler walked on water you would think that there was something crazy about that, right? This is either Hitler's biographer or this is some nut job. Or if they were claiming that, you know, the Normandy invasion actually took place because of an invisibility cloaks that the 29th division, you, again, we would come to the conclusion that this is either fantasy or this is incorrect, or this is just, you know, there's something wrong here. And so for someone to say, okay, is it reasonable to believe in miracles? Well, then we have to put that in its proper context. It's not just, is it reasonable to believe in miracles? It's, is it reasonable to believe that God is capable of producing miracles? And I think most people would look at that and say, okay, I will concede that if there is a God, then God would be capable of doing something miraculous, which we usually associate with, you know, breaking the the laws of physical reality that we can observe and things like that. But I've, I've had people really get hung up on this. And um, for instance, I had somebody once that told me, he goes, do you really believe in the virgin birth? Like you really believe that's what happened or you don't believe, you, or do you believe that some Jewish girl was just trying to, you know, you know, come up with a really convenient excuse to Joseph, oh, right? Oh, the Pantera excuse. Right. right. So, so it's this, I said, well, wait a second. I said, okay, <laughs> are, are, do you have a problem with the virgin birth because you believe it's, it's fantastic or miraculous? Well, Yes. Like, okay, so you have a problem with miracles explaining something. Yes. I said, okay, and so therefore that that leads you to believe that the Bible is not trustworthy and that Jesus' claims are not trustworthy. Yes. I said, okay, so what, what you, you want evidence for God that is that is concrete, that you can see right in front of you, and, and that's what you want. And anybody talking about miracles, that doesn't make much sense to you. Yes. I said, okay. I looked at him. I said, okay, great. Um, I'm God. I'm right here in front of you. I'm telling you I'm God. I'm going to go ahead and require your worship now. He goes, I don't believe you're God. I said, oh, okay. What what would you said that for you to believe in God, he had to show up, present himself to you, tell him he was God. I just did all of those things. How come you're not worshiping me? Well, you you got to do something miraculous. Uh, uh. Oh, I got to do something (laughs) miraculous. 
Got him. Right in front of you, right? right? And, and if I don't do it directly for you, you won't believe. You're not going to believe the testimony of other people that are claiming this happened. But the only thing you'll accept for proof of God is a miracle. But then when somebody writes about a miracle that they witnessed, you automatically discount it as impossible. Because and therefore, of the miracle. Because of the miracle. Require. Right. So again, <laughs> you've come up with a contradictory standard with respect to what you will accept as evidence of God. So again, I'm not telling people to believe everything that somebody claims is a miracle. But I'm saying that if you're just going to discount the idea of the miraculous, you're probably discounting the one thing you would accept as evidence of divine intervention into a situation. And that doesn't make sense. That's not a re you, again, you're not being reasonable if that's the thing that you're going to discount when it's the only thing that you would accept as proof of divinity. And, and he, he kind of looked at me and he's like, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> um, so, so again, when you, when you look at individual things within, within miracles, the Bible, you look, walking on the water or healing the sick or whatever it is, if you want to be skeptical of, of claims of miracles, I completely understand that. I'm skeptical of random claims of miracles. I'm skeptical of that. But that's very different than looking at a text where somebody is purporting to either talk about a direct agent of God, right? Like God acting through Moses or God acting through Elijah and them doing something miraculous or Jesus, God himself, God in, incarnate saying, doing something miraculous. Well, no, these are the things that you require as evidence. Have you ever um, heard the quote from Richard Nixon's uh, former special counsel, uh, Charles Coulson, who was one of the people that was implicated in Watergate and yeah. went to prison for it. Um, he ended up converting to Christianity later on in life. And he has a really funny quote where he says, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured it if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. <laughs> You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. <laughs> well, and this, there's an interesting book called The Case for Christ. And, um, Is that Lee Strobel? Lee Strobel wrote this book. And Lee Strobel was an atheist. He was a skeptic, or I should say a skeptic. And his wife converted to Christianity. He was actually very upset by this. And he was an investigative journalist. So he went through the process of trying to determine whether or not the claims of Christianity were, were reasonable, right? And, and really, he was, he was out there to disprove it. He was trying to demonstrate to his wife and everybody else that this was just... Again, this was fairy tales. This is flying spaghetti monster. This is a coping mechanism for adults that can't handle reality. And he ended up converting to Christianity. And one of the things that, that he really hits in that book, The Case for Christ and The Case for Easter, is when he talks about the different testimonies that are provided within the four Gospels. And when he talks about things like miracles and did Jesus really raise from the dead. Now, Again, people will sometimes say, oh, four Gospels are, are a problem because these four Gospels don't say the exact same thing. It's like, well, if you read four biographies about a person, would you get the exact same story? You would certainly look for contradictions, but we don't have contradictions within the four Gospels. We have emphasis on different aspects of their life, different things that they did. Yeah, perspective. You have different perspectives, mm -hmm. right? You have different writing styles, right? Luke is writing this from the perspective of a doctor. John is writing this as the perspective of a disciple, right? There, there's different perspectives. And, and when those perspectives come together and create a more complete picture without contradicting the story, that's strong evidence, not weak evidence. That's, you know, it, it would be problematic if you had four different gospels and they essentially all said the exact same thing. That's the part where from a, a, a witness standpoint or investigator standpoint, when you look at this, this seems contrived. Right. You were told what to say. You were told what to say. You were told what to write. You did it obediently in order well, to achieve an objective. Nick, what's it, the counter to, I mean, the, the question literally just dawned on me, but like, what's the counter to the argument that, that somebody that might know about this topic a little bit more than the layman who brings up, well, what about all the apocryphal texts, right? You know, the yeah. gospel of Thomas or. Well, that, that's the thing. Whenever you, whenever you arrive at obvious contradictions. So when, whenever we look at, there's a word called hermeneutics, right? And it has to do with, with basically a faithful interpretation of text. And so like, if I'm writing something, Right. If like if I'm writing, uh, you know, a story about something and then somebody else comes in and writes a similar story to mine, but it but it drastically contradicts what I'm writing. Well, if I'm the authoritative writer on something and somebody else writes something else over here for which we don't have the same authority or attestation or whatnot, 
the question is, is that are you gonna are you gonna hold me what I wrote, and and higher you know basically esteem and degrees of accuracy than you are the the person over here that just happened to write something, you know maybe or maybe around the similar time but directly contradicts what I'm writing. Well, the answer would be no, right? You you would you would go with the um, early attestation. You would go with the person that actually writing it that was the eyewitness. You wouldn't go with the person that never saw any of this stuff and decided to write their own thing. You wouldn't say that, well, it's the gospel of Thomas. Thomas was a disciple. Okay, but we have nothing suggesting that Thomas actually wrote the gospel of Thomas. And when you read the gospel of Thomas, it directly contradicts what we have within gospels that we know were written by the people that claim to write them. And so right off the bat, you look at that and say, okay, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in. If, if I'm faithfully interpreting the text and assuming that there's going to be logical consistency within it, then something that directly violates that consistency is probably not something that I'm going to put on an equal playing field with the things over here that do correspond, right? And that's just, we, we do that as a faithful interpretation of any text. Um, the other thing that I would say, and this is to your point earlier about what Colson was saying is that people say, well, okay, well, there's a lot of people that faithfully believe in something, right? There's, there's people that believe in Muhammad, right? There's people that believe what he said. There's play, people that believe what Buddha said, and, and they are faithfully living out their lives. They're willing to die for it. So what's the difference? The difference is, is that there's a, there's a massive, massive difference between Muhammad, which claimed to be speaking on behalf of God, and Jesus, who was claiming to be God. Muhammad is not claiming that he rose from the dead and then told his, his small group of disciples to go out there and say that when they know it didn't happen, right? So when you have the disciples who all claim to see Jesus, know Jesus, physically be there with Jesus, Jesus is crucified. They saw it. They were terrified. They were terrified. They, they, they were not fully aware that he was just going to raise three days later. They didn't know that. When that happened and they witnessed it, right, and you have the, the whole story of Thomas saying, I will not believe it until I feel the holes in his hands, right? What you're now saying is that either Thomas just, like, hallucinated all this, like the, all these people that saw Jesus after the resurrection hallucinated and then decided to dedicate their entire life right? Which didn't win them fame or prosperity or peace or security no. at the time. It, it actually them brutal deaths. It, it actually Most resulted in it, it, brutal oppression, mm -hmm. brutal oppression, death for, I think all of them, except for John who died in exile on the Island of Patmos, right? So what you're telling me is they knew that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. They knew it. They knew it didn't really happen. But then they decided to go out and choose one of the most difficult and hardest lives possible, ending in brutal torture and death, all to prop up a lie which benefited them nothing. It's right. also worth pointing out that like the road to Damascus story, right? Where, yeah, with Saul. where Saul is, is you know, he, he has this, this experience and then he converts to Christianity. You, you kind of have to ask yourself the question of, why would a guy who is fairly high up within the authority of, of the Jewish faith, who was persecuting Christians, yeah. who at this point were a, a fringe minority of a fringe minority within the empire, you know, you know, considered totally irrelevant outside yeah. of Judea and within even there were heavily persecuted. Why would he convert to this this religion that he, you know thought was a, was a heresy at best and just a complete fabrication, you know, from a bunch of crazy people at worst. And instead he, he converts to it, right? The, yeah. the, the, the road to Damascus story is, is crazy when you think about it, especially when you consider the fact that if you say, well, it was just a hallucination, right? He just went crazy and he had a hallucination and then he converted to Christianity. Oh, okay. So does that explain why it apparently was a collective hallucination? Yeah. A collective hallucination <laughs> happening to many people at different times, at different parts of, of you know, because he is, wasn't Israel, alone. Syria. No. Well, and, and, and again, this, this goes back, this goes back to the point where, you know, again, you could try to explain this away, but say, well, it's God, God can do miracles. And so God did a miracle. Okay, great. But it, it also, again, going back to the original question of the podcast, is it reasonable to assume that a bunch of people would, would, who, who saw it again, it's one thing for somebody to believe something out of faith because they didn't actually see it for themselves. It's somebody else. It, it is entirely different for someone to know the truth, right? So if Jesus didn't raise from the dead or Jesus wasn't, they know it, they know it because they saw him crucified. They saw him put in the, like they saw it all. And yet they were so convinced that he did raise from the dead that they were, they were willing to die for it. They were willing to commit their entire lives to it. Again, 
it is not reasonable to assume that they just made it up or were suffering from some sort of mass hallucination. It's more reasonable to assume that they honestly believed it. Now, you, you can try to come up with some justification in your head on why they would actually live their lives that way if they knew it wasn't true. And that's usually where the hallucination philosophy comes into play. But then again, it's not reasonable to assume that level of hallucin widespread hysteria on something so specific like that. Um, so again, you can, you can try to reason it away, but the real question is, is it reasonable to believe that if you think that, you know, the, the Bible is, um, accurate to the, to the extent that we can demonstrate its accuracy. And that comes with historical things, archeology, span um, you know, uh, outside attestation, if you believe that's something that you also want to look at. And then also the idea is, is it reasonable to believe that people would actually sacrifice themselves in such a way for something they knew was not true? Right? It's reasonable to believe that people sacrifice for something they believe is true, even though it isn't. It's not reasonable to believe that somebody will go through such sacrifice for something they know is not true unless they are getting something out of it, right? They're a huckster. But they weren't. And they were given no promise of it, at least in this lifetime. And if he's a fraud, they don't have any reasonable belief that there's going to be something on the other side. In fact, their entire culture. And the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees predominantly believe Jesus was a fraud and, and somewhat of a, a heretic might not be the right word, but certainly a fraud. And so they weren't even promised anything in the afterlife if Jesus wasn't who he said he was. And so I think that's all important to think. The next thing I want to talk about is that is, is it reasonable to believe that Christianity is the only way to God? This is something that bothers a lot of people because sometimes they will come to the conclusion like, okay, maybe there is something to Christianity. Maybe there is something to Jesus's teachings, but it's, it's arrogant or it's presumptuous to believe that this is the only way to God. The problem with, the problem with saying that is that Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I had a student once uh, come up and she was, she was very frustrated by this. And she said, you know, Mr. Freitas, isn't it unreasonable for us to make the claim that Jesus is the only way to God? You know, what about people that will never hear about Jesus? What about this? What about that? And I said, well, well, run me through a little bit on what your reasoning is here. Give me your reasoning. Give me your logic. Right now you're telling me emotionally you, you, you feel like this is unfair, but what I want to, what I want to understand is logically, why is, why is it incorrect? And she goes, well, I was talking to my friend. He's a very devout Muslim. And he also believes in, in God and they believe that Jesus was a prophet and they believe these other things. And, and he's saying that it's, 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 it's arrogant for me to assume that this is the only way. And I asked her, I said, if your friend was, um, if your friend went and, and you were standing on top of a 12 story building and your friend really, really believed that he could fly, that he could jump off and he could fly. And you said, I think that's wrong. I think that is, that is verifiably false. And then in fact, if you do so, you're going to fall and you're going to die. And he said, how arrogant for you to assume that your interpretation of the reality that we're looking at right now is the only way to interpret it. That if I jump off, I'm going to fall. I, I could, maybe I could walk, maybe I could fly, maybe I could hover. Maybe I could, there's all these other interpretations for what could potentially happen if I would jump off. Would it be rude or mean or arrogant or presumptuous of you to look at him and say, no, you're going to die. And she goes, well, no. I said, exactly. Because what we're analyzing, and, and guess what? He decided that you believing that was wrong. He said that what you believed was wrong. Is that presumptuous of him? You see, both of you are making truth claims. The truth claim you're making is Jesus is the only way to heaven. The truth claim he's trying to make is that there's multiple ways potentially to heaven. Well, one of you is wrong, but both of you are making truth claims. It is not arrogant or presumptuous to make a truth claim that is accurate, even if it excludes things, because truth is by definition exclusionary. Truth says that this is accurate and this is not accurate. It doesn't do so because truth is mean. You could certainly convey truth in a way that is mean. You can discuss truth in a way that is rude, but it doesn't take away from what objective truth is. And so the, the answer is not, is it mean or presumptuous or arrogant to suggest this? The question is, is it true? And his, is his assumption that there are multiple ways, is that true? Because I'll tell you this much, if he's wrong and, and, and people are eternally separated from God because of it, was his position compassionate? Was it compassionate because it was more inclusive of other ideas? Inclusive ideas can also be inaccurate. They can be false. 
And if they're wrong, it doesn't matter how inclusive they are if they're wrong. If I give you multiple directions to get to a particular building and they're all inaccurate, did I help you or did I hurt you? So the, the argument here is no, it's not unreasonable to believe this because again, if you're, if you're starting off with the idea that, okay, I think it's reasonable to believe in God. Okay. I think it's reasonable to believe that scripture has been faithfully translated over time and that the authors that wrote it actually believe what they wrote. Okay. And now I think it's reasonable to believe that when the Bible speaks about Jesus, they are talking about someone who claimed to be God and then you're going to come to the conclusion, but it's not reasonable for the person claiming to be God to give you the specific directions on how to get there or how to meet him or how to come to the father. Well, no, again, that's, it's not, un, it's not, it is reasonable to assume that if all these other things are true and that if Jesus is who he says he is, then it's reasonable to assume that when he says, I am the way, the truth and life, no one comes to the father, but through me, that's a reasonable claim. And it doesn't matter that there's, 50,000 other claims for how to get to God. The question is, is which one's true? So I, I think it's, again, it's important to, it's important to clarify that you might not like that there's one way to God. You might not like that Jesus said that, but whether or not it's true exists regardless of your preference. Just like whether or not it's, you know, whether or not you're going to jump off the building and fall is true regardless of whether or not you'd prefer to be able to fly. All right, we got a couple more that we want to go through here. Um, so th here's one that I want to uh, address, and it's a little bit different on the on the philosophical side, but it it has to go. Is it reasonable to believe that if God is all powerful and all good, that bad things would still happen? Right. This is the problem of evil. This is the problem of evil question, and it's rooted in this notion that if God, like, it's almost a deductive argument, right? If God was all powerful and if God was all good, then clearly God wouldn't want bad things to happen. And so therefore, bad things do happen. Therefore, God either doesn't exist or he's not good, right? That's the, that's the conclusion they come to with their premises. Now, here's the other thing that I always, I always like to throw out sometimes as a question to atheists is I, I will usually ask atheists, you know, in, in, in when they talk about a lot of a lot of the ones that are hardcore and kind of talk about this disdain that they have for God, a lot of that disdain is rooted in God's authority. God telling them how they should live and what they should do. They don't like that. They want autonomy over their own life. They want to be the ones to make their own decisions. Right? You can even run this back kind of the to the the original conversation between the serpent and and Eve, like eat of this and you will become like God, right? That was the that was the offer. So here's the question. If God had created a universe where you were incapable of resisting God's will, you were incapable of resisting God's law, you could certainly potentially exist in a universe to which maybe there was no pain, maybe there was no suffering, but there would also be no love, no justice, no ability to make any sort of decisions, none of it. Because when we talk about love, we talk about a genuine feeling of someone that has the choice to love or not love. And so one way you can look at it is, okay, well, God created an environment where he gave people a, a degree of agency over whether or not they wanted to be with him or listen to him. Mm -hmm. And then when they choose something else, is it really reasonable to go back and yell at God and say, why did you give me this choice? Right? Is, is that reasonable? The, the whole story of, the, of Adam and Eve in the garden originally was he gave them one choice. He gave them one, he gave them one command. The command was don't eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That I mean, was, wait a second. That was the one command. Don't do that. Don't do that. Almost immediately broke that command. Right. And then you get more commands after that and more commands after that to where it's basically, it's, it's God telling us, look, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a degree of agency over your life because I want to have relationship, right? That's the, that's the Christian message that God wants to have relationship, that he loves you, that he's willing to sacrifice for you in order to have that relationship, but he's not willing to tyrannically demand that you accept it. Now, most of us love the idea of not being tyrannically controlled and, and dictated to and told to do a certain thing. But now we turn back around and we point a finger at God and we say, wait a second, I don't like this freedom that you gave me because it gives me the freedom to make bad decisions. Yeah. I like the, the problem of evil is an interesting one because 
I, it's I honestly I actually feel like it's kind of overhyped. Um, it, it's it, so often presented as just this defeater of God. I, I remember um, growing up getting into very minor theological arguments with my father about this. Um, my, my father's a very well-known atheist, not not well-known to other I mean, people, yeah, but like yeah, within but... our family, well, very well-known atheist. Um, I remember I was walking and I was having a conversation with him once and I was like maybe like 14 or something like that. And he was like, Christian, it's 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 simple, you know. A girl's riding a horse and she falls off of it and breaks her necks and dies. You know, God could have prevented that from happening, but he didn't. So either he's incapable of doing anything to prevent it from happening or he doesn't care. It's one or the other. And and so he's either not as powerful as he claims to be, in which case, why should anybody worship him? Because he's incapable of preventing bad things from happening or he's indifferent to it, which again, why should we care then? And what... I think now that I'm a little bit older, what I find so fascinating and what separates Christianity from so many other world religions or philosophies or belief systems is that God is not distant from the suffering of the world. Mm-hmm. He partook in it. Mm-hmm. He, he He's not the sky daddy floating up there observing, neutral observer, just watching events unfold. It's not, he's not sky daddy. He's not a deist, I, you know, the, the, the deist interpretation where he's entirely separate from the universe and he just created some clockwork universe and let it in motion. Christianity makes some very specific claims that he participated in the suffering, that he himself suffered, that he took on, on human flesh, that he was hungry, that he was sad, that he was, was physically murdered, brutalized too. Tortured, what? tortured, humiliated, rejected by by his own friends, by his own followers. There, there's, there's no other religion out there that claims that that God undertakes that degree of suffering in, in order to achieve reconciliation. And and people sometimes ask, okay, why was it necessary? Well, here's what's interesting about this, and this is again, I, I think if people are willing to give this an honest hearing, they'll they'll see some some truth in this. It is, it is difficult to have love and justice apart from one another, right? If, if you claim to love someone, but then you hurt them or you do something else, we question your love for them because you did something unjust, right? If you, if you believe in justice, then what you're essentially saying is that that which is evil must be punished. So what do you do with a creation that you've given some degree of agency to that has chosen to rebel against you? If you just say, hey, you're forgiven, no problem, no big deal. Well, then the law doesn't matter. The law doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. Right? So there has to be punishment for that. Well, then how do you achieve the punishment? Well, it has to be, somebody has to voluntarily take it on. That's when we talk about this concept of grace. It's this idea of, I am taking on the punishment which must happen because there was an injustice. Justice must be satisfied. But the love of God calls him to come down and accept the punishment because he's the only one that can. For justice to be satisfied, there must be punishment. But the love, the mercy component is there, and the one person that can actually take on that punishment can only be the one for which there is no justification for them to take it on. They have to choose it. And that that is the whole message of Christ. It, it's that deep desire for reconciliation, God's deep desire for reconciliation with his creation, that he doesn't want to make robots, that he doesn't want to say, just do what I say and I'm going to give you no other option. I want genuine love. I want genuine relationship. I want genuine justice. And the only way any of those things can be achieved is if there is an element of choice. That's it. You take away the choice. It's no longer genuine love. It's no longer genuine justice. It's no longer genuine choice. And so this is the one environment, this is the one reality that can be created where all of those things can remain intact, where you can have love, where you can have justice, where you can have choice, and you can have reconciliation. You can choose not to believe it, but are you going to tell me it's not reasonable to believe it? Are you going to tell me it's not reasonable to believe that that outcome is the one that had to take place in order to keep love and justice intact? I, I think it's actually incredibly convincing. The other thing I, I 
kind of want to let, let's let's kind of wrap this up. We've been going on this a while because I want to give some more people some resources and whatnot. But I want to I want to wrap all this around by going back to the original David Hume quote that we started off this this chapter on. And I'll read it off for you again. If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school of metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. He makes this statement as a comprehensive refutation of the idea of theology for which Christianity would fall within it. Now here's the real question. Mr. Hume, looking at your statement, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does your statement contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Then by your own test, Mr. Hume, I must commit your statement to the flames. See, this is one of the biggest problems that you get with so many of the arguments against Christianity or the existence of God is that they are, your feet are firmly planted in midair. See, before you can even get to the question of evil, you have to come up with some sort of objective standard which differentiates evil from good. And if your worldview doesn't allow you to do that, if it doesn't prevent it or provide you a mechanism for doing that in any sort of objective sense or authoritative sense, if it's all just your personal preference, then what you and I are describing as evil are two entirely different things. Your definition of evil is just that which you do not prefer or don't like or, or, or find offensive. My, defini my, defini my definition of evil actually rests upon an authoritative standard because if God is God and he says, don't do these things, then that's authoritative. The question is, is why is he telling us not to do these things? And what we find out over and over again, not just within scripture, but within how we live our lives in practical reality is the reason he's telling us not to do it is because it hurts us. And the reason why I want to point that out is because when we talk about things on this show and we tie it back to our Christian worldview, I want people to understand that it's not, it, as you're listening to us, I'm not demanding that anyone agree with me, but I, I at least want you to understand kind of where we're coming from. This isn't like the one thing that you can kind of toss out and say, well, I really like what they have to say about economic policy, or I really like their explanations on inflation, or I really like what they have to say about traditional masculinity or femininity or raising kids or, or strong marriages. But I, I just, I want all that, but I don't want this. I just need you to know this is where we get it. It's the foundation of our entire worldview. Everything that we talk about can be drawn back to some sort of foundational truth or principle which is tied up in this worldview. It's the C.S. Lewis quote that says, I do not simply believe in the sun because I see it. I believe in the sun because by it, I'm able to see everything else. And so I would just encourage you to understand, regardless of where you're coming at with this topic, regardless of what you actually believe, I'm respectful of, of individuals' ability to make their own choices because if God gave you the ability to make your own choice, who am I to deny you that same privilege? But I'm certainly going to be honest about what I believe and why. And if I believe it's the truth, I'm not going to keep it from you because I don't want you to be uncomfortable. Because just like the example I gave of my friend, when we're talking about something that we honestly believe ultimately is the difference between life and death, reconciliation, or, or voluntary banishment, at the very least, I owe anyone that listens to me the explanation so that you can make an informed decision about what it is you're going to choose to do. Because ultimately, it's not about the God of the Bible, the God that I believe in banishing people to something. It's about the God of the Bible coming down and giving us every single opportunity to be able to say, choose this over this. And if we end up choosing the wrong path, I think it's a little bit unreasonable for us to come to the conclusion that it's God to blame. Last thing I want to do is just give everyone some, some references here. Um, some various things to, to kind of look at. And, and again, the, the first and foremost, I want to say this, like my, my, if you look at Christian theology and what we believe, 
we, we believe in scripture. We believe scripture is authoritative and we believe that you can read it and you can get wisdom and instruction from that. Um, and because we believe it's divinely inspired, we also believe when it's you know properly interpreted um, that, that that has authority in and of itself. It doesn't rely upon outside forces to validate it. Um, we, we also, we also believe in, you know, again, father, son, and Holy spirit. We believe that God does, um, you know, intervene, uh, to the extent that he chooses to, in order to help us understand something in order to move us toward a particular way of, of thinking about something or understanding something. And I know to a lot of people that seems kind of mystical and crazy, but again, the thing I would ask you to believe, or the thing that I would ask you to consider is that if, if the arguments that we have laid out up to this point, you find at the very least to be reasonable then it's also not unreasonable to believe what I just said. There's some other people here that I, I have found helpful. I'm not saying they're authoritative. I'm not saying that they, you know, <laughs> uh, that I would necessarily agree maybe with everything they said on every individual topic, but I have found them useful. So a couple here, there's this one group called Ask Cliff, and he has, he's at givemeananswer.org, and we'll put these in the show notes and whatnot. You've probably seen Cliff a lot. He's kind of a tall guy, kind of, um, you know, wiry, curly hair, older gentleman, goes to a lot of college campuses and whatnot and engages with people and, and takes on the tough questions and provides a- answers, which I have found very, very useful and I have found very um, um, effective at times. So give me an answer.org. Ask Cliff. Again, he's on Instagram. R.C. Sproul at uh, legionnaire.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R.org. R.C. Sproul, I thought, has always done a very, very good job of uh, arguing from a, a philosophical position. Uh, William Lane Craig at reasonablefaith.org is another one who I think has done a good job um, of, you know, He's been in several debates where I think he's performed incredibly well. Uh, Greg Bonson is one of my favorite. The Bonsoninstitute.com. That's B-A-H-N-S-E-N Institute.com. Bonson actually engages in what we call presuppositional apologetics. And it's it's a fascinating um fascinating form of argumentation. There was a, a famous debate between Greg Bonson and um, an atheist named Gordon Stein. And Gordon Stein had been making the argument that it was unreasonable to believe in Christianity because it essentially violated the laws of logic. And he was largely making a materialistic argument, which is to say that, um, you know, there's the material and the immaterial. And again, keep in mind his fundamental argument against Christianity, which is that it violated logic, violated logic. And so he asks Greg Bonson in this debate, he goes, is God material or immaterial? And, and Bonson says, immaterial. He goes, what's, what's, the, what's the definition of material? He goes, that which stretches across space and time or occupies the space within space and time. He goes, Greg Bonson, can you think of anything else you believe in with this you know, level of commitment that is immaterial like this? And Bonson goes, yes, the laws of logic, right? Because the laws of logic are immaterial. Love is immaterial. Reason is immaterial. The scientific method is immaterial. And so it, it's important to understand that, again, Greg Bonson had, had tackled this from a presuppositional standpoint. He goes, he goes, okay, Gordon Stein, your presupposition is that logic is authoritative, but you just said that God is not authoritative because he's immaterial, but the very thing you're relying on to give you authority is also immaterial. It's a great argument. Frank Turek at crossexamine.org. He's another person that goes to, um, argues along a, I think a good uh, philosophical, historical timelines. Um, John Lennox, who we, we talked about today, johnlennox.org. That's uh, John, uh, J-O-H-N-L-E-N-N-O-X.org. Uh, John is, a, uh, I believe, a professor at Oxford um, and a mathematician and has done some incredible work um, Again, some of it talking about, okay, let's 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 put aside, you know, maybe certain differences of opinions with respect to atheism or evolu- Darwinian evolution, and and um, and the Bible, and let, let's just start to look at Darwinian evolution and actually see if the science really does justify this belief system. And uh, I think he's done some incredible work on the mathematical front, along with with others that we we mentioned earlier, um, basically explaining that look. <laughs> Um, you, you don't you don't even need to be a Christian to be very, very skeptical of a lot of the things that we've been taught from the origin of the species, from this idea that, um, you know, that, that Darwin's explanation of existence is, is accurate. You don't you don't even need to be a Christian to come to the conclusion that there's some real problems there that probably need to be addressed. So. I, I hope you find those helpful. I, I hope you find the discussion that we kind of had today and some of the questions that we addressed to be helpful. Again, our goal here was not to make a comprehensive argument for Christianity. Our goal was to show you that 
this isn't our crazy uncle side, right? Like, like when you say that you, you like what we say on economics, or you like what we say on family, or you like what we say on these other things with respect to values, um, that they are rooted in something. And the thing that we believe in is not just sky daddy. It's not some sort of elaborate coping mechanism. Cause I can tell you this much, if you were going to make up a religion, you probably wouldn't make up Christianity. Um, because within Christianity, we're not promised everything is going to be wonderful and kind. In fact, we're promised as Christians that we're going to be persecuted for our faith. And so the only question is, is why would you believe it? Well, if you're only believing in Christianity because you think it's going to be, you can think it's going to make everything wonderful, or you think it's going to make you rich, or you think you're owed this if you believe these things, I can promise you that's not the case. We believe it because we think it's true. And we certainly believe it because we think the explanations provided within do a great job of explaining the human condition. And honestly, the worse things get, the more relevant a lot of that scripture becomes. And I can tell you this much, as time goes on, one of the reasons why I can look around a lot of the, the chaos that's taking place, and I may be frustrated about it, and I may fight against it, and I might try to help others fight against it, but the reason why it doesn't cause me at any moment to lose faith in what I believe is because my identity is in Christ. And while I certainly don't live up to everything that is wonderful and beautiful about that identity, the one, pro one of the promises that we get in that faith is the peace which surpasses all understanding. Now, I want to explain something real quick because that's, that's an important point. It's not the peace that everyone understands because everything is going super well. You know, you're, you're prosperous, you're safe, you're secure, you're loved, you're warm, you're fed, you're clothed, you're housed. That's not what it is. It's the peace which surpasses all understanding. Well, I would posit that what that means is that when chaos is reigning, not just in everywhere around you, but even in the stuff that you're interacting with on a daily basis, you're still secure in your identity. You're still secure in your meaning. You're still secure in your purpose. And when you have those things, I'll tell you this much, it makes it much easier to confront the things that are going on that you might not have a lot of control over. So, I hope we've made a good argument today. I want to thank you for, for listening to this. I want to thank you for giving us a, an audience and a chance to explain what it is that we believe, because quite frankly, we owe that to you. We owe that to you. And I hope we did a good job of it. I'm sure this topic will come up. I'm sure there'll be questions that we'll have to address on, on other shows. I'm sure there'll be more in-depth ways that we, we track things down. Christian would love to do an episode dedicated exclusively to concepts of you know, quantum mechanics and the implications and, and what that has for theology. But today we just wanted to go over something fairly simple and, uh, and hopefully do a good job in the process. Once again, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you next episode.